On any given Sunday, you can wake up in your Sean John sheets, slip on a pair of Rockaware jeans and a t-shirt, put on your Beats by Dr. Dre headphones, head on over to the 4040 Club where you can watch Geno Smith throw a few more interceptions and then drown your sorrows in a glass of Armand de Brignac champagne, Ciroc vodka, Douce cognac, or Delian tequila. And at every turn of your day, one of those three guys, Jay-Z, Diddy, or Dr. Dre, will be making money. And I don't have my clicker. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So Jay-Z, Diddy, and Dr. Dre last year alone made $740 million pre-tax. For frame of reference, that is half the GDP of Liberia, which is a country of four million people. Great for those guys, bad for Liberia. Um, so how exactly did this happen? How did these guys, all three of them from very modest means, uh, one from Compton, one from Brooklyn, one from Harlem, turn hip-hop into this multi-billion dollar industry, or at least help turn hip-hop into this multi-billion dollar industry. Um, but even more interestingly, how did they help hip-hop change the way that fame is monetized in all areas of the entertainment world? And that's what I'm hoping to uh, answer for you guys today. So before we kind of dig into the, the uh, Diddy, Jay-Z, and Dr. Dre angle, we got to get in the time machine and go back to 1973 uh, in the South Bronx back to 1520 Sedgwick Avenue, uh, a low-income housing development, the Bethlehem of hip-hop, as DJ Cool Herc calls it. DJ Cool Herc uh, was one of the kind of pioneers of hip-hop, and he really invented the technique of having two record players next to each other and the same record on it so that you could elongate the break, which is the most danceable part of the song. Um, soon hip-hop kind of coalesced around this idea uh, in the South Bronx and started having kind of other components added to it. So we have uh, emceeing, which is rapping, the aforementioned DJing, um, graffiti, and breakdancing, and then Africa Bambata, who was another hip-hop pioneer, added another one, knowledge. So how do we get from that to all that cash? Uh, and I think that one of the earliest and best examples is My Adidas, which is a song by Run DMC. So by the 80s, hip-hop had kind of gotten to the point where there were a few pretty big-name acts. Run DMC was one of them. And they had this song called My Adidas, which was a very innocent ode to these shoes that they really liked a lot. There was no money involved. They didn't get paid for it. They just liked their Adidas shoes. Um, however, their manager, Russell Simmons, another uh, epic hip-hop figure, uh, decided that there was probably a little more money that they could get out of this whole situation. So he invited the German Adidas executives over to watch Run DMC play a show at Madison Square Garden in 1986. And uh, the result was pretty incredible. Um, Run DMC went on stage, they took out their Adidas shoes, they waved them in the air and asked everybody in the audience to do the exact same thing. And the German executives upstairs in the skybox saw the most amazing display of marketing power probably in their entire careers. They gave uh, Run DMC a million dollar shoe deal uh, that very year and uh, it kind of catapulted uh, hip hop into this new realm of monetizing fame. So around the same time or a little after, uh, somebody took that idea and basically multiplied it by an order of magnitude. Um, and it's not Ronald Reagan or Nancy, it's Michael Jackson right there in the middle, uh, the king of pop, but you might also call him the king of hip hop in many ways because he's tremendously influential um, to hip hop as a genre, both musically uh, in terms of you know, his songs that have been sampled over and over again, uh, but also in terms of uh, the commercial aspect. And um, in 1990, he got a $20 million shoe deal from LA Gear to launch his own shoe line. That's actually a higher guarantee than Michael Jordan had gotten from Nike uh, around that period. Of course, Michael Jordan ended up making a lot more than that on Air Jordan, but you know, details. Uh, Michael Jackson also had a clothing line that he got $28 million for. And in 1995, he sold half of his Beatles catalog, which he had purchased for $47.5 million in 1985, for $115 million. The other half turned into half of Sony ATV, which is now the largest publishing company in the world, worth about $2 billion. And uh, you can read more about that in, in my book. And even Ronald Reagan likes it. <laughs> <laughs> we got out the Ouija board for, for that one. Uh, <laughs> so meanwhile, back to hip hop. Um, some interesting things were happening, uh, some good, some bad. 
Among the Good, 1991, Nielsen SoundScan pioneers this new way of, of basically measuring record sales. Um, up to this point, it had only been kind of done by surveys of record store clerks and owners, and only the labels really knew how much uh, uh, was being sold. Um, but Nielsen SoundScan was this new point of sale technology. You could actually tell what was being scanned at the stores, and, and suddenly you had all this data, and you could actually see what music was popular. Uh, and some of the surprises were grunge rock, country, and hip hop. So as the 90s rolled on, uh, a, an epic rivalry developed between the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, namely between Bad Boy Records and Death Row. And out on the East Coast, it was Biggie was the most prominent rapper on Bad Boy, which was founded and run by Diddy. There he is again. Uh, and then on the West Coast at Death Row, you had Tupac, Dr. Dre, uh, Snoop Dogg, and that was all run by this guy, Suge Knight, um, who's got a rap sheet longer than I have time to recite in these 18 minutes. Uh, but suffice to say, he was quite a, a, a notorious character. And one of my favorite stories about him, maybe apocryphal, maybe not, was that he dangled vanilla ice over the edge of a balcony by his ankles in order to get him to sign over his royalty rights to Suge Knight. Uh, you know, you can, you can ask him about that, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. So, so it's not so surprising that in this environment, um, you know, some bad things happen, namely the death regrettably of Tupac and Biggie, uh, and both murders have never been solved to this day. Um, but the, the curious thing, did this violence actually hurt record sales for hip-hop? Not really. Um, actually, by the end of the 1990s, hip-hop was outselling country, uh, and Tupac and Biggie were replaced by gobs and gobs of cash. Uh, so hip-hop kind of emerged from this violent period um, into kind of a, a new commercial dawn, if you will, and uh, one of the things that became apparent was that rappers really liked to rap about brands. Among them were clothing brands. Um, some of the early favorites were Fat Farm, FUBU, Echo, and these made it into music videos and got a lot of free advertising. Uh, another one was called Iceberg, and that was a favorite of Jay-Z. And he rapped about Iceberg so much that the sales of this company went through the roof. So he and his business partner went over to Iceberg and said, hey, can we strike a deal where you, know, you give me an equity stake or you give me some kind of endorsement deal where I get paid every time I rap about your company? And the guys at Iceberg basically laughed him out of the room. So he said, all right, well, I'm going to stop rapping about Iceberg and I'm going to start my own thing, Rockaware. So he did that, 1995. Then a couple years later, Diddy did Sean John. And then just a deluge, you have... Uh, 50 Cent's G-Unit Empire, Pharrell's Billionaire Boys Club, uh, T.I. with a coup, and even Lil Wayne got in on the action a couple years ago with Truck Fit. And the earnings that resulted were staggering. Um, Diddy, for example, you can see him there with Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, in 1999, $54 million pre-tax. Uh, then 2003, Eminem and Dr. Dre, $35 million. 2005, 50 Cent. <laughs> Uh, 41 million dollars and so this is all by just inserting you know basically products that that they owned or, or were profiting off of for products that they just liked but didn't have any financial stake in and uh, so this is where I kind of come in a little bit uh, the, the, you can see right here this is the chart that uh, I've been uh, editing at Forbes for the last seven years we call it the Hip Hop Cash Kings list. And in 2007, I was fresh out of college and an editor came over to me and said, hey, you're under 30, do you like hip hop? And I said, yes, I love hip hop, I grew up on hip hop. And he said, great, she said, great. Uh, you know, will you help me put together this list of the top earning rappers? We'll call it the Hip Hop Cash Kings. And I agreed. Uh, fast forward about a month and I'm driving around New Mexico on assignment and on the radio, what do I hear but this? The Giants play in New York. Forbes, one, two, three. You get the idea. Uh, Forbes, one, two, three. I get money, I get money, the remix, et cetera, et cetera. So it was Jay Z, Diddy, and 50 Cent, and they had put together uh, a, a, basically a remix of a 50 Cent song in honor of appearing on the Forbes list at number one, two, and three. <laughs> And, and suddenly, we all felt a lot cooler about being business journalists. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but more importantly, we realized that, that we kind of stumbled into this you know, underserved market, which was kind of putting a number on hip-hop wealth. 
And you know, a lot of hip hop at this point was bragging about who had the most, but nobody really, there was no neutral arbiter who said, actually, yeah, you know, Jay-Z, you have the most, or, or, uh, or 50 Cent in this case. And, um, and so it kind of d developed a you know, life of its own, and that's why I've been doing it every year uh, since then. And uh, the last chart, we'll kind of get into the, the higher numbers uh, in a couple slides here, but uh, Dr. Dre, just his, his number last year was so big that I had to shrink down the chart so that we could fit everything and still see the, the points on the, on the graph. Um, so I want to get into just a couple of the, the big deals that these guys have done over the years. Um, for Diddy, I think the biggest one is Ciroc Vodka. And uh, you know, there you can see him up there with, with, um, with Ciroc. He, uh, <laughs> in 2007, Ciroc was only moving 120,000 cases a year, making it roughly number 50 uh, of all vodkas in the world. So Diageo, which is the company that owns the brand, decided why not bring on somebody who can help just really jumpstart this thing? What do we have to lose? So they gave Diddy this kind of ridiculous deal where they share profits with him and they promise him a split of any uh, sale if they ever sell the company or uh, the brand he gets half of everything after they take out their costs. So Diddy comes on, uh, 2008, he starts referring to himself as Ciroc Obama, uh, and you know, kind of like passing out Ciroc everywhere he goes, at parties and all his famous friends, and getting photographed with it and so forth. Uh, 2009, Ciroc moves 40,000 cases. Uh, so Diddy's kind of thinking this is a pretty good idea. Uh, next year, he does a little Super Bowl commercial. You could cue it up here. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, then basically every few months it seemed like from that point on there was a new flavor of Ciroc, a new commercial, a new you know lyric with Ciroc in in it, you know, uh, a new video, and, um, and the results kind of continued uh, along that trajectory. Uh, nearly a million cases in 2011, and this, this year it's close to uh, two million, which is depending on how you count, right about number two behind Grey Goose. Not bad, and uh, meanwhile, Diddy's net worth soared from 500 million to 700 million dollars. Um, so that's uh, that's Diddy, yeah. <laughs> <Damn. laughs> uh, my favorite deal for Jay Z is not necessarily his biggest deal, but um, the story begins in 2006 when Frederick Rousseau, who was a manager at uh, Louis Roederer, which is the house that makes Cristal Champagne was interviewed by The Economist and asked what he thought about all these rappers rapping about his champagne. And he said, basically, we can't forbid people from buying it. Not the best way to retain uh, a new audience uh, and, and kind of continue to grow market share. Um, and so as a result, Jay-Z, when he found out about this, publicly declared a boycott of Cristal. Uh, no more Cristal in his songs or his 4040 clubs, and uh, pretty much everybody in hip hop followed suit. Uh, then in 2006, in October, these mysterious gold bottles, which you can see here, uh, appeared in his video for Show Me What You Got. Um, as the story went, Jay-Z had discovered this you know, beautiful uh, golden bottle of champagne in a mom and pop shop in New York, and he liked it so much that out of the goodness of his heart, he decided to put it in his video. And that didn't seem too likely to me. Uh, so while I was writing my book, Empire State of Mind, about him, I. Uh, went over to France. I, I managed to get a tour of the Catier uh, Champagne House, which is the company that makes these mysterious gold bottles, known as Armand de Brignac Champagne. Uh, and you know, I, I went through, and what you're looking at is the cellar is 100 feet underneath the ground. Um, and these bottles are just blank gold bottles, uh, no label attached to them yet. Which, when I got home, really struck me, because I found out that there was another brand uh, put out by the House of Catier called Antique Gold. In 2000, and that was discontinued in 2006. That bottle sold for 60 bucks. The new Armand de Brignac Ace of Spades uh, Jay-Z approved bottle sold for $300. Um, <laughs> so then the thing that, that really sealed the deal for me uh, and why I like to call it Jay-Z's champagne secret, uh, I realized that Armand de Brignac didn't debut in the United States until the fall of 2006. That was months after the video was shot, meaning there was no way he could have discovered this brand uh, in a mom and pop shop. So I kind of did a little Columbo, like, hey, one more thing uh, to the people at Katye, and they admitted that actually, oh yes, 
well, you know, we did have some conversations with him before. Uh, long story short, I talked to some other people in the industry. They figured that Jay-Z was getting about $5 million a year and had an equity stake in the brand um, and that it had all been set up uh, from the beginning that way. So no surprise uh, that it ended up in his video. So the, the, the story kind of unraveled for, for Cartier and, and we kind of see what's actually going on, which is that in the end, Jay-Z makes scads of cash as he usually does. Um, and then the, the kind of big kahuna of all these deals is Dr. Dre. Um, in 2008, he and Jimmy Iovine were walking down uh, the beach. Jimmy Iovine's the CEO of Interscope Records, or at least he was. And um, Dre said to Jimmy, I want to make sneakers. And Jimmy says, forget <laughs> uh, sneakers, let's, let's make speakers. And, uh, and then what unfolds is 2009, their celebrity friends start wearing these Beats headphones uh, from LeBron James to Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga. Uh, Jimmy Iovine institutes a rule, unwritten rule, that uh, all Interscope artists have to include Beats headphones in their music videos unless it's period specific. And, uh, and then things start to really take off. Um, Beats gets a market share of close to 60%, I think a little more than 60% actually, uh, around this time of the $100 and over headphone space, which is kind of unheard of for a company that didn't exist three years, four years earlier. Um, and it's so successful that HTC decides to buy half of it for $300 million. Beats then buys that back, and in 2013, Carlyle, the private equity group, pays $500 million for an undisclosed stake, valuing the company at more than a billion dollars. And then finally, in 2014, Apple buys Beats outright for $3 billion. Now, after this, Dr. Dre said uh, that he was a billionaire. That's not actually true because he took a huge tax hit, um, but still worth probably in excess of $700 million at this point and only going up. Uh, so I think it's safe to say it's a good thing they decided to make speakers instead of sneakers. Uh, so there's a saying that I kind of like to close with, which is that great entrepreneurs don't create um, companies, they create categories. And I think that's certainly true with Dr. Dre. Uh, now he's working for Apple. Um, Jay-Z's now starting a sports agency called Rock Nation, uh, same as the, his uh, record company. Uh, and then we've got Diddy, who's moving into Revolt TV, uh, Tequila with Deleon, and he even wants to buy a professional sports team. He told me last year at South by Southwest, he put in a bid for the Knicks, nobody called him back. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, regardless, um, I think the most remarkable thing is to look at how hip hop has changed the way that other parts of the kind of fame galaxy uh, operate. So it's not just rappers that now seem to every one of them have to have a clothing line like Akon up there. Uh, but you know, every pop diva appears to have a fragrance and every actor has some kind of venture capital interest uh, and, and the list goes on. And um, at the end of the day, I like to say, it's not bad for a genre that started out in a rec room in the South Bronx. Thank you very much.